Hi, this is Jason Nickleby, coordinator of officials of the Minnesota State High School League, and this is the NFHS football rule study presentation number one. We are going to be taking a look at NFHS football rules and how we can study those rules and get better. Um, mechanics and errors in judgment will happen, but we really shouldn't have any errors with, with rule application. And that's been a challenge that we've had in every sport with the league, and we want to uh, give you some information so that we can be more effective in our rule study and application as it relates to NFHS football rules. So we'll take a look at uh, one rule or two each week, look at the most important aspects and how we can get better at applying those rules when we have them in games. Rule knowledge is fundamental to what we do in officiating, and that's especially true in football. Uh, football is almost all rules and a little bit of judgment. Um, if you take a look at other sports, basketball is almost all judgment, a little bit of rules. So kind of demonstrates how important it is for rules knowledge and football in particular. And, you know, we'll make errors in mechanics and judgment. You know, you should be at the pylon or you should have been at the line to gain or you were in the right spot and you just made an error in judgment. That's going to happen every game for the rest of your career. Um, but rule application errors are within our control. If we make mistakes in that area, it's because we weren't concentrating, we don't get our nose in the book, or we get into group think. So um, those kind of things really should not take place. Um, supervisors and assigners, we, we can't defend errors in rule applications. I can defend errors in mechanics and judgment um, all day, every day. That Those are easy to defend. You did the best you can, and you made a mistake. We're human. you know. But it's really hard to defend when we either misapply a rule or we just kind of make up our own rule. So uh, really hard to defend that. So we got to do our best to really only apply a rule if it is in the NFHS rule book. And not to scare anyone, but there have been litigation situations involving rule misapplications. And so it's just really important for officials to get our nose in the book and then only apply rules that are, our, that are in the NFHS rule book. Our approach to rule study applies to every official. We've all heard, I don't need to know that rule, the referee will know it, or you know, someone else on my crew will take care of that. And we really all should be the go-to person. You know, not that you don't trust your crewmates, but I've always felt that I should just trust myself to know the rules in case someone else doesn't know that rule and I should be the crew saver. So, um, go into your rule study, go into your games with that mentality that everyone on the crew is going to be a rules person and they are going to be the go-to person if something happens in the game. So, you know, make sure you keep your rule book around until you get a new one. You know, make sure that you're studying early in the summer, even in the winter for that matter. Pull it out, take a look at a few pages and, you know, try to spend just a little bit of time each day looking at the rule book. You know, looking at an entire book in one day is not going to be useful. You're not going to enjoy it. Um, so you want to just limit it to, you know, a few rules or, a ch you know, a couple pages every day leading up to the season. That way you are fresh and you can really concentrate on the, the few rules that you are looking at. Um, take a look at the case book um, and rule book throughout the, uh, throughout the season. You know, try not to just spend one or two days in each of those and then be done with it because there's no way that you can pull together all the rules that you need to be successful. Um, make sure you highlight key and complex rules. Uh, some would say that the whole thing is complex, but really highlight the ones that happen a lot um, so that you're ready for uh, those kind of plays. And then the, the other plays, you know, you just have to work through with your crew, but make sure that you have the real, you know, common plays uh, down pat and then you know another recommendation is assign crew experts so you know you're the overtime expert or you're the PSK expert uh, or whatever the the topic might be so um, when you're having a pregame or you're in the car driving to the game referees just say hey overtime expert cover three topics from uh, overtime that you think we should know about and talk about what do we do with accepted fouls under two minutes or whatever the case may be so that when you get out to the game, we we're, we're really have our, our frame of mind ready uh, to officiate football that night. Again, our approach should be that we should be in the case book in conjunction with the rule book. I know that 
in Minnesota. We did not receive a casebook this year, but it's still available on the NFHS Central Hub. It's available um, on the app. You can purchase a hard copy. Um, but the casebook gives you real play examples that can provide insight into how the rules should be applied in a game. So if you're looking at the play examples from the casebook, it will have rule references so you can look at the play, see how the rules apply, and then you can go over to the rule book and check out those rule references um, so that you can refer back to the casebook if needed. And then when you have those plays and games, you'll be ready uh, to apply the rules that, that you have seen. Um, you know, combining the, the use of the rule book and casebook will help you understand the meaning and the purpose of the rules as they are written. Um, you may not understand it when you look in the rule book, but then when you look at the casebook and see how it's applied, um, you can make a better judgment about how you're going to apply that in your games. Um, there's rules and then there's philosophy of how we apply the rules, and that's kind of an art and science piece, but the casebook gives you a pretty good idea of how you would apply the rules um, the way that they want them to be officiated. And visualize these plays from the casebook or any other plays that you come up with as you study the rules. Imagine yourself in your position, if you're a line judge, if you're a referee, or whatever the case may be, and then imagine how you would report this to the referee if you have a foul on that particular play, and what you would say, and then referees you would visualize and practice your announcement. So there's lots of ways to apply these rules um, and apply this study uh, to make you a more effective official on Friday nights. We should be continuing to study the rules uh, throughout the season. Again, we talked about it earlier, not just one day, not just a couple times. We really need to be in the book and talking to our buddies and going through quizzes um, to really get a good grasp of the rules in football, and it takes a long time. Um, I'm still not there 100% myself, and I've been officiating football for 20 years, and I'm still not there. So it tells you it takes some time, it takes some dedication and practice uh, to get better. And to do that, when the game is over, self-evaluate, take a look at plays that you had in your game, and then take a look at the rule book and case book to see if you applied those correctly or what you can do better. And then, you know, another suggestion is when you're watching college or professional games or other high school games, mentally enforce the penalties using NFHS rules. And that's a pretty common mistake that we make at every level of football, really, is we try to apply rules that only apply to other codes. So, um, you know, a common one is a kickoff in high school football that is muffed and crosses the goal line and we allow it to play out and that play should be dead but that is a live play at the other levels of football. So um, when you're watching those games, you know, visualize what you would do in a high school game and then also you know, mentally enforce the penalty that would occur if it was a high school game, if at all, and then pull out the rule book or case book uh, to verify that what you did is correct. As is the case in pretty much any rule set, any sport, um, across all levels, the foundation for the rules is definitions, and in this case, Rule 2 in the NFHS rulebook, um, we need to know these definitions to be effective in our officiating. Um, and again, true in all sports, if we don't understand what the definition of a term is, it's hard to apply it when a rule or a situation happens that uses that definition. So, you know, we need to know, for example, what's a chop block? What is clipping, blocking below the waist, when can you do that, free blocking zone, snap, targeting, spearing, force, spots. There's a very big number of definitions that we need to know, and that's what makes it difficult is that we need to get our nose in the book and understand these definitions because if we don't understand what, for example, what's the end of a kick, then it's really hard to apply succeeding spot, PSK, um, there's a number of situations that happen in a game that if we don't understand one definition, then it's really hard to apply the rules um, when they happen in situation in our game. So we're going to start with rule two, take a look at some play situations um, just to get you talking and thinking about um, those rules. And we'll take a look at some uh, casebook uh, references as well. 
to get uh, get ourselves thinking about definitions and how they apply. But this is the foundation. We're going to start with Rule 2 and then move into other rules as we go along with the season. But if you're going to start anywhere with rule study, this is where you should be. So I picked out a few plays to take a look at involving definitions. Of course, they involve a number of rules, but these are some of the casebook references in the NFHS uh, casebook and we'll take a look at uh, several of these situations so again so we can think about rule application definitions and how we can study those and get better so these aren't the most important plays perhaps in the casebook but just a few examples so we can get thinking about um, about rules and definitions and how they apply so this particular one 217-2 the back A29 is lined up behind the quarterback A8 within the free blocking zone as A8 drops back to pass, A29 blocks B77, who is in the free blocking zone at the snap below the waist. So the ruling for that play situation is that we have an illegal block by A29. Um, an offensive player has to be on the line of scrimmage and in the free blocking zone at the snap in order to block a defensive player below the waist who is also on the line of scrimmage and in the free blocking zone at the snap. So. You know, our interpretation with blocking below the waist is they need to be on the line in the free blocking zone, blocking someone else who's on the line in the free blocking zone, and they need to do it pretty much immediately. Um, the ball has to be in the free blocking zone when the block takes place. And so if it's a shotgun type play or a toss sweep or something like that where the ball leaves the zone really fast, um, almost all the time if they don't do it immediately it's going to be a foul but we need to understand the definitions of free blocking zone and blocking below the waist and then the limitations for those blocks 226-3 situation runner a1 is advancing towards b's goal line and is buried near the sideline in a a1 advances to b's end zone while holding the ball outside the sideline plane or in B, A1 dives towards the end zone but is hit by B1, which causes him to land out of bounds beyond the goal line extended. A1's last contact with the ground was short of the goal line, and in both cases, the ball breaks the plane of B's goal line extended. So the ruling for this play would be that in A, we have a touchdown because A1 was touching inbounds when the ball broke the plane of the goal line extended. However, in in B, since A1 was not touching in bounds and was short of the goal line when he was hit, it would not be a touchdown even though the ball did break the goal line plane extended. Um, the ball would be spotted at the inbound spot on the yard line where the foremost point of the ball crossed the sideline plane when A1 was driven out of bounds. So we need to understand the goal line um, when it's extended, when it's not. Um, how that relates to forward progress and where we put the ball. And so we would need to get our nose in that part of the rule in addition to understanding the definition of lines. 242-1 situation, B1 tackles runner A1 with A, a cross body block at the knees, or B, a block from behind and below the waist, C, his arms and shoulder, or D, a trip with his foot. The ruling for this play would be in A, B, and C, all legal methods of tackling the runner. They can bring down the runner using those, those techniques. However, tripping the runner is not legal um, this year, and you see the rule references 245, 935C, and 943O. Um, those are the references we'd be looking at. And so when we're looking at tripping, we're looking at an intentional act, not some a defender falling over and accidentally tripping the runner, but you know an overt act. They actually stick their leg out and try to trip the runner. So that's what we're looking for uh, with tripping, but want to make sure that we have our definitions down as to re relates to proper type of tackling and blocking. So to conclude, we're going to look at getting better in the rules this year. That's our that's our goal. That's why we're doing this this series to try to really get our nose in the book, take a look at a few plays, how they apply, and then get out and talk with our, our crewmates and buddies and you know meet with them and go over plays um, so that we can get better. So there's going to be strategies that work for you. They may not work for me, may not work for your crewmate, but do what works for you 
but I, what I would tell you is don't try to read the whole rule book in one sitting. That's just not going to be effective, not enjoyable. You know, cut it down into small manageable parts and connect with your crewmates and friends. Um, that's how you're going to get better and that's how you're going to enjoy it. Um, you know, use the strategies uh, that work for you. And again, be the go-to person. Don't rely on the referee. That's not fair to them that they have to be the one that we rely on or go to. You know, be that go-to person. You know, take pride in your rules, knowledge, and application and that you're going to be the person that can step up and save the crew if need be. And we discussed this earlier, but be defendable. And being defendable means applying the rules that are in the NFHS rule book and not using other codes. So we're not using fourth down fumble rule or some other rule that applies in another code, a legal contact. We don't have that in NFHS football. So be defendable. If you use the rule book and apply only those rules, that's very easy to defend. Um, and if we get our nose in the book, we're going to have higher confidence because we know that we know the rules and have them down pat. And if we are more confident, in our rules knowledge, we're going to have more fun in games. So um, that's the goal of this this presentation and this series, looking at rules and getting our nose in the book um, so that we can have higher confidence in our rules knowledge and have a great time doing it. So um, thanks for tuning in to this presentation. I really want to send a special shout out to Mike Graff and George Wynn for their assistance with pulling out this information. Um, really appreciate their expertise and guidance on this. And hopefully these rules, uh, situations, and the other information in this presentation are helpful for your crew as we get going with the 2019 season. And uh, best of luck in your games coming up.